Hello everyone and welcome back to the channel. My name is Blair or the Illuminati and today we're going to talk about an entire industry, the sleep industry. Now, before I dive into this, I want to put a disclaimer out there that everyone obviously sleeps differently. This isn't a one topic fits all kind of thing. If your eight hours straight is working for you and you sleep well, that's awesome. Stick to your schedule. I'm not trying to tell anyone how to live their lives, obviously. However, I found this topic really interesting because along with, you know, most everyone I know, uh, I don't really sleep well. And it turns out there might actually be a reason for it. A reason I honestly had no idea existed until recently. So let's get into it and take a look at what the sleep industry has been up to. Before the industrial revolution, sleep was actually broken up into two four hour chunks with an hour or so of activity puncturing sleep. This was called bimodal or biphasic sleep. Without electrical and unnatural light, people would go to bed with the sunset, wake up and do chores, and then go back to bed for another cycle before sunrise. According to historian A. Roger Eckerch and sleep researcher Sioban Banks, some people still naturally wake up in the middle of the night, but experience anxiety because they believe they need to sleep continuously through the night. But biphasic sleep can correspond healthily with our natural sleep patterns. In one experiment, 15 male subjects were studied as they slept in circumstances lacking any unnatural light to imitate the conditions of prehistoric people. After three weeks of this, the subject's sleep became biphasic. This suggests that biphasic sleep is a natural process. The seven to nine hours people operate on today may even disrupt natural circadian rhythms. So what exactly is a circadian rhythm? It's a term we've heard before, and I know it's important though, we may not know exactly why. A circadian rhythm is essentially our biological clock. It's why your energy might be low in the morning, then your body temperature rises during the morning and you have increasing alertness, then maybe you see an energy dip in the afternoon, you get the picture. In pre-industrial societies, segmented sleep may have been more helpful with this rhythm. And no, I'm not saying we should definitely go to bed earlier, wake up in the middle of the night and then go back to sleep again. Again, you gotta do what's right for you. And that may not be reasonable for most people now. But I find this really fascinating because I've always just been taught that you have to get eight hours of sleep a night and nothing more. One study states that segmented sleep was common across pre-industrial Europe throughout the year, not just during long winter nights. Whether in Northern England or Southern Europe, this pattern of sleep reflected at most the limited effect of seasonality at least in countries located south of Northern Scandinavia where seasonal variations in the availability of natural light were pronounced. Even in the siesta cultures of Spain and Italy, seasonal variations were modest despite reliance on napping to combat the intense midday heat. During the summer months, some men and women to be sure were apt to work or socialize later at night, but longer hours of daylight ordinarily extended sleep onset and in turn, the time of first rising by most at one hour. As in many pre-industrial cultures, sleep onset depended less on a fixed timetable than on the existence of things to do. In the winter, whether for conveniality or work, pre-industrial households remained active well after sunset, not retiring until nine or 10 or later when visiting with neighbors. People relied on primitive illuminants such as rush lights and oil lamps or on the natural light of the moon and stars on clear nights, even to perform unskilled chores such as chopping firewood. In other words, we used to sleep based on the time of day and the weather, which kind of makes sense, honestly. Now with industrialization, air conditioning, things of that sort, things have obviously changed. And biphasic sleep wasn't unique to Western households either. It occurred well beyond the bounds of Europe and North America in other cultures and continents, including the Middle East, Africa, South Asia, Southeast Asia, Australia, and Latin America. In 1555 and in the early 19th century, there's references to first sleeps. One Australian anthropologist while living in Southern Africa between 1958 and 1964 said that the Gui people there never have an uninterrupted night's sleep. There was always someone awake adding wood to the household fire, eating a snack, seeing to a child, listening to some strange noise in the bush, or keeping watch if dangerous animals are near. For this reason, the divisions of the night are almost as important as those in the day. One article says that segmented sleep is not only more in sync with our body clocks, but a lot of people have called it a golden time for creativity. Research has confirmed distinct physiological differences between those who are up with the roosters and habitual night prowlers. There's a ton of articles out there speculating why we're most creative at night. 
Some chalk it up to the quiet, inspiring nature. Others say that being tired can actually make someone more creative. But I've got to wonder if maybe this circadian rhythm has anything to do with it. It's an interesting thing to think about anyway. So what changed? If people were sleeping well, and they certainly don't seem to be nowadays, then why adopt this eight hour long sleep schedule without a break in between? Well, we mentioned it briefly, but the standard of sleeping for eight hours straight came from the industrial revolution. It was actually Henry Ford of Ford Motors that broke new ground in labor policies. Don't get me wrong, Ford's done a lot of good and bad, but in early 1914, he raised the living wage for many, offering $5 an hour when the average auto worker was making half as much and it was unheard of, but it boosted productivity and built a sense of company loyalty and pride among his workers. In 1922, Henry Ford's son, Edsel, said that every man needs more than one day a week for rest and recreation and reduce the work week from six days a week to five. However, as great as this sounds, the workload maintained the same, six days worth of work crammed into five. He's widely credited for starting the 40 hour work week as well. Obviously the guy was influential. Many at the time wanted this, I know that nowadays we feel that it's absolutely ridiculous how much of our lives are simply just put towards working and survival, but the 40 hour work week was marked an improvement from 100 hour work weeks in 1890. Many Americans do work more than 40 hours a week and the most productive companies aren't necessarily the ones with the most hours. The Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development has found the countries with the highest average number of working hours are some of the least productive. For example, Luxembourg, one of the most productive countries in the world has an average work week of just 29 hours. So is the 40 hour work week outdated? Absolutely. But again, it's better than what we had before. This meant that for many, an equal division, eight hours working, eight hours for leisure, chores, etc., and eight hours for sleep. Just as the eight hour workday became standard, so did eight hours for sleep. With this equal division, the industrial revolution essentially killed naps and segmented sleep. And I mean, yeah, I guess people could still segment their sleep, like go to bed at 10, wake up at two, have a couple hours to do whatever you want, sleep again from four to eight before going to work. I'm willing to give it a try at least, but for many, it seems that it's just cutting into that precious leisure time. One article called How the Industrial Revolution Killed Naps says, just as the industrial revolution actually took several centuries to completely unfold, it was really only until the 1920s when references to first and second sleep dried up. And nowadays the conventional wisdom is that eight hours of sleep is what's healthy, with segmented sleep rarely mentioned in the US except in reference to the Spanish siesta. The thing is, our bodies aren't built for sleeping in eight hour blocks. For example, Dr. Thomas A. Weir, a psychiatrist, experimented by removing artificial light from the equation of test subjects. That meant no smartphones, laptops, or even light bulbs for 14 hours a day. At first, there wasn't any change, but after several weeks of experimentation, the Weir's subjects ended up reverting to the first and and second sleep pattern that's been around since at least Homer. There's more science behind segmented sleeping as well. According to a New York Times article, a NASA finance study found that the cognitive benefits of sleeping can be achieved after as little as 24 minutes of napping. It's also worth remembering that sleeping eight hours a night suits the nine to five workplace. The point is for the most part, aside from lunch and water cooler chats, which aren't usually long enough for a nap anyway, work time is relatively uninterrupted. Hell, one doctor's manual from 16th century France even told couples that the best time to conceive was after the first sleep when they quote, have more enjoyment and do it better. End quote. It was around the late 17th century that the first and second sleep really began to dry up. And by the time the industrial revolution was complete, it was almost like it was completely forgotten and never existed in the first place. Street lighting, domestic lighting, a surge in coffee houses, sometimes ones that are open all night, all led towards people staying up late instead of having this segmented sleep cycle. Attitudes of doctors did change with the times though. And a medical journal in 1829 urged patients to force their children out of a pattern of first and second sleep. And sure, on the surface, it seems like people have adapted well to eight hours of sleep, but some say that many current sleep problems like insomnia and the like are due to us not utilizing segmented sleep. That New York Times article I mentioned a moment ago states that as of 2012, when this was published, nearly a third of all working adults get about six or fewer hours of sleep a night. 42% of workers in the mining industry have complained of being sleep deprived and 27% of the financial or insurance industry. It reads, Doctors who peddle sleep aids and call for more sleep may unintentionally reinforce the idea that there is something wrong or off kilter about interrupted sleep cycles. Sleep anxiety is a common result. 
We know we should be getting a good night's sleep, but imagine we are doing something wrong if we awaken in the middle of the night. Related worries turn many of us into insomniacs and incite many to reach for sleeping pills or sleep aids, which reinforces a cycle that the Harvard psychologist Daniel M. Wegner has called the ironic processes of mental control. As we lie in our beds thinking about the sleep we're not getting, we diminish the chances of enjoying a peaceful night's rest. Even though we will get into stories about how segmented sleep works for some people, that's only the anecdotal evidence. And as we know here, personal testimony doesn't always count as proven data, but it is, you know, just personal testimony. So to start, let's look at what research has to say about this. And we'll start with the study sponsored by NASA. This study led by David F. Dinges found that letting subjects nap for as little as 24 minutes improves their cognitive performance. In another study conducted by Simon Durant, a professor at the University of Lincoln in England, the amount of time a subject spent in deep sleep during a nap predicted his or her later performance at recalling a short burst of melodic tones. And researchers at the City University of New York found that short naps help subjects identify more literal and figurative connections between objects than those who simply stayed awake. Robert Stickold, a professor of psychiatry at Harvard Medical School proposes that sleep, including short naps that include deep sleep, offers our brains the chance to decide what new information to keep and what to toss. That could be one reason our dreams are laden with strange plots and characters, a result of the brains trying to find connections between what's it's recently learned and what it's stored in our long-term memory. Rapid eye movement sleep, so named because researchers who discovered the sleep stage were astonished to see the fluttering eyelids of sleeping subjects, is the only phase of sleep during which the brain is as active as it is when we are fully conscious and seems to offer our brains the best chance to come up with new ideas and hone recently acquired skills. When we awaken, our minds are often better able to make connections that were hidden in the jumble of information. Whether or not anyone wants to try this or thinks it's better, at the very least, I find this interesting that we used to sleep this way and this was very common and what we do now is very uncommon and potentially unnatural. There's been quite a few studies about this biphasic sleep in mammals as well, with being their correlation between shorter phases and higher risk of predators. But again, I found it kind of cool that other mammals also use these sleep patterns. In other studies or articles, like one published from Ohio State University, it says that our REM and non-REM sleep all have different cycles. For some, it's easier to be woken up than others. And I agree with that part, but it also claims that one likely explanation for waking up at the same time each night is that you go to sleep at the same time and then you reach a light stage and wake up. Sure, maybe that's the case, but what if you purposefully stayed awake for a few hours before going to bed? I guess I'm just curious what segmented sleep might look like in the modern world, like if it was actually globally implemented. However, this study doesn't really mention segmented sleep or suggest trying it. It says anxiety, depression, acid reflux, hormones, menopause, sleep apnea, and thyroid dysfunction are all among the reasons why we may not be able to get back to bed. They even have at the bottom of the page, a link to an article that suggests choosing an adjustable pillow to improve your sleep. And no, that does not mean a my pillow. It's time to take a break from today's episode to just really quickly thank our sponsor, HelloFresh. HelloFresh cuts out stressful meal planning and grocery store trips, which God knows I hate those, so that you can enjoy cooking and get dinner on the table in about 30 minutes or less. HelloFresh offers over 23 recipes every single week, featuring a range of flavors, cuisines, and ingredients so you'll never get bored. And eating healthier has never been easier with low-cal, carb-smart, vegetarian, and pescatarian options every single week. Cut down on grocery bills by saving up to 40% instead of shopping at your local store. HelloFresh delivers pre-portioned ingredients so you're not overbuying, which is a burden on the planet and your wallet. HelloFresh's Easy Eats offerings has a ton of quick and easy meal solutions like 10 to 20 minute meals, low prep recipes, and quick breakfasts and lunches. Perfect for my busy schedule, but I'm sure it's good for you guys too. I I just can't do effort in food. I'm just not that person. So this is really easy for me. So if you want to get started today with HelloFresh, make sure to go to hellofresh.com slash casket10 and use code casket10 for 10 free meals, including free shipping. Get started today with America's number one meal kit. Go to hellofresh.com slash casket10. Use casket10 for 10 free meals, including free shipping. 
But it's really no wonder that the sleep industry is able to sell us on sleep aids, luxurious pillows and mattresses, and it's all because we're desperate for sleep. According to one source, today, the problem of too little sleep and the quest for more of it is as acute as ever. 27% of people in a new consumer report survey of the 4,023 US adults said they had trouble falling asleep or staying asleep most nights. And 68% or an estimated 164 million Americans struggle with sleep at least least once a week. A good night's sleep can require everything from the practical, a cool, comfortable pillow, to the ethereal, a deep sense of calm and peace of mind. The modern marketplace has exploded with proffered solutions for people who can't sleep, from mattresses to white noise machines, sleeping pills to sleep coaches. Americans spent an estimated $41 billion on sleep aids and remedies in 2015, and that's expected to grow to 52 billion by 2020. According to Natana Raj, an analyst with BBC Research in Willesley, Massachusetts. I can't say for sure if the sleep industry knows for a fact if segmented sleep is better, but they definitely know that trouble sleeping is incredibly common and they have no problem taking advantage of it. Now, as for the sleep industry, let's dive into that a bit. Sleep awakenings by today's standards aren't considered normal. Ohio State has said that and Harvard Health Letters have said the same. It's true that a lack of sleep can make it harder to think and easier to become irritated and anxious. I'm not suggesting that we shouldn't get proper rest but are interruptions actually the problem? This Harvard Health letter says that age, drinking alcohol, napping too much, too much caffeine, medications, chronic pain, and enlarged prostate gland, other chronic health conditions, they're all reasons why someone may wake up at night. Again, by no means do I want someone to dismiss these. I'm not a doctor. Really, I'm just some pyramid on the internet that finds the idea of segmented sleep and its history interesting. And hey, if your doctor says you're healthy, but you keep waking up at 3 a.m., maybe try and do some dishes, walk your dog, do a load of laundry, and then try falling back sleep again. There's no harm in at least trying for like a couple nights, right? The sleep industry is a $70 billion industry and that is billion with a B. So that we're clear, this eight hour sleeping schedule isn't exactly working for everyone and someone is obviously profiting off of it. Pretty sure all the statistics we've gone over thus far prove that eight hours of sleep isn't exactly the most ideal for us. One writer for Fast Company states, the good news for the sleep deprived is that we're living through a golden age of sleep aids. A decade ago, sleep aid was synonymous with sleeping pills, but but these days, medication only makes up 65% of the market. The last three years have seen an explosion of other types of products designed to help people fall asleep more easily and stay asleep longer. Initially, many of these sleep tools were tech gadgets, including sleep trackers, apps, lights, and noisemakers, many of which I tested for a story in 2017. But more recently, the trend has shifted towards low-tech products like weighted blankets, temperature-regulating duvets, and pillows with built-in hoods to block out light and keep sleepers head warm. I think we're increasingly coming to understand that technology is partly what is causing us stress and insomnia, says Catherine Ham, Barbie's founder. Consumers seem to be gravitating towards products that take them away from all of this blue light, but sleep aids are big money. In 2017, they generated $69.5 billion in revenue worldwide, and analysts say the industry is on track to hit $101.9 billion by 2023. And given what we know about how sleep impacts our quality of life, it is perhaps unsurprising that consumers are willing to shell out a lot of money for these products. People spend hundreds of dollars on weighted blankets because, well, it's really hard to put a price on getting a good night's sleep. I mean, hell, I'm one of those people. I sleep with a weighted blanket at night. I don't know if it helps me or not, but I at least tell myself it does. And I'm sure with high anxiety and high stress statistics among Americans that the idea of getting eight hours of sleep is not becoming any easier. So these sleep aids become increasingly needed. Not to mention our phones. Forbes has an article that claims the main driver of growth of sleep labs and sleeping disorders being diagnosed is that we're using smartphones, laptops, tops and television later and later into the evening. The blue light, the article states, tricks the brain into producing less melatonin, a crucial hormone for restful sleep. Bottom line, it's not any one thing. Health, blue light, stress, anxiety, I'll be honest, I don't know anyone whose sleep isn't a total wreck these days. Whether that's being unable to fall asleep before 3 a.m., needing perpetual naps to function, 
me, it's more common than not. I mean, I'm a horrible example of that. And I know a ton of people that don't work nine to five jobs who are up all night and all day working. So maybe I'm not the best case study here. But generally speaking, the sleep industry has, at least to some extent, convinced us that if we only have the right mattress, the best weighted blanket, some sleep aids and more sleep aids, then we'll maybe get the best sleep of our lives finally. One Guardian article reads, good night's sleep helps our memory, learning, and mood. So it is no wonder that an industry of bright-eyed sleep entrepreneurs has awoken around the quest for better, deeper, longer sleep. They are offering everything from sleep trackers to white noise machines and high-tech pajamas that claim to create an advanced sleep system for better rest and recovery, made from bioceramic material that absorbs the body's natural heat and reflects that energy back into the skin. Then there's a new robot versed in thousands of years of Buddhist breathing techniques that promises to soothe you to sleep only if you spoon it. Yours to order for only 466 pounds, $637 USD. But what does the meteoric rise of this industry say about our lives? Are we in a sleep crisis? The simple answer is yes, says Dr. Guy Meadows, the co-founder and clinical director of Sleep School, which runs insomnia clinics in central London. We are in a sleeplessness epidemic. A perfect storm has settled over our bedrooms and it is stopping us from drifting off. Tiredness, he says, is the new norm. Going back to a much earlier tech revolution, the sheer fact of electricity means we can choose to stay up until all hours. We've invaded the night, says Dr. Russell Foster, the director of the Sleep and Circadian Neuroscience Institute at the University of Oxford. And we fitted more and more into the working day. Sleep has been the first victim. Work was once unlikely to be allowed in the bedroom, but now can be commonly found there and not just in the form of midnight email sessions propped up on pillows. Shaw points to the insecurity of the gig economy. It has ramifications. Everybody is worried all the time about where the next paycheck is coming from, he says. I can absolutely identify with this. It's not that I'm up till one in the morning trying to calculate out every single dollar to try and figure out what I'm doing when or having a late night recording session because I was just too tired during the day to function. And I know I'm not the only one that does stuff like this now, but I'm absolutely chatting with writers and editors and whoever else I work with on the team at all hours of the day because they live all across the world. So I'm the one who feels that I have to accommodate to those time zones, which means I don't get sleep anymore, which is fine. YouTube is a job that's really hard to put down. And I know that for myself, other YouTubers and friends that I talk with, and even for the freelancers that I work with that help me out with my channels and projects and stuff like that, it feels almost impossible to find a day off unless you schedule it far in advance. And even then I'll make plans with some of my IRL friends to do something, even if it means like just going through a drive-thru and getting a coffee or something and talking in the car for a little bit. But like, like even I just forget that because I just get so caught up in having to feel that I have to constantly work. As the article continues, therein lies what a lot of chatter around sleep seems to miss, that many people can't afford to get enough. A good night's sleep has become a luxury. Those in richer countries tend to get more and the richer people in those countries tend to get more than the poor. According to a University of Chicago study from 2006, US adults are more likely to get more sleep and sleep better if they are white, wealthy, and perhaps surprisingly, women. So you can imagine my shock on that one because that study got me fucked up. As for if segmented sleep can actually help with this, well, I was curious to take a look at the anecdotal evidence. And again, huge disclaimer here. These are just people's experiences with trying segmented sleep. This doesn't mean it'll work for everyone. This doesn't mean it'll magically make you have more energy if you try this. Anecdotal evidence is not proof. This is just something that I was curious about and I figured some of you might be curious as well. With that being said though, let's take a look at what Peter wrote in a Guardian article in 2016. Over the years, as the pace of life has quickened, I've been forced to change my sleep habits. My latest attempts have taken me to the world of segmented sleep, which the French elegantly call Dorville or wake sleep and then finally a second sleep through the morning. There is extensive research showing that humans have historically slept this way. During the wake sleep, people often read, wrote, prayed, and even visited neighbors. Conception was even believed to be more likely between these two sleeps. I wish I could tell you that I came to trying segmented sleeping voluntarily. The truth is that it was thrust upon me by modern life. When I was at high school and university, I got an eight hour sleep without fail. The changes came later with a job and family. International time zones combined with a new baby meant the glory days 
days of blissful, uninterrupted sleep through the night disappeared at the tail end of a dream. Working as a scientist, living in California and liaising with collaborators in Australia meant that I often needed to be up in the middle of the night. Later, as a writer in London, it was the same. The nighttime waking period was prime time. More constructively, nighttime is the quietest time. And so for me, as a writer, it is the time when I'm most productive. The whole world is asleep. My stories peek around the corner, check that the coast is clear and gradually creep to the page. I was comforted to find that many writers feel the same about segmented sleep, that the waking period in the depths of the night is a golden time for creativity. There's a unique intimacy during the wake sleep, a hushed tranquility and peace. It's almost a confessional between you and the page. Of course, there are some drawbacks to an unorthodox sleeping pattern. Returning to sleep after the waking period can sometimes be hard. I often find this when my brain is fertile from writing, especially if I've had a particularly productive wake sleep, but it's rare. The body clock kicks in and the second sleep comes naturally. Personally, I found this to be the deeper, more restful sleep. We're often told it's not the amount of sleep you get, which is important, it's the quality. We're also told never to eat anything our great-grandmother wouldn't recognize as food. Given that segmented sleeping is something our great-grandmothers might just recognize and it sounds scientific basis as a sleep regime is in tune with our natural circadian rhythms, perhaps it's just the thing to solve our chronic sleep shortage. And hey, it works for Peter, right? Who knows if it'll work for someone else watching this? I'm sure as hell gonna give it a try. And as many of you know, Osmedia is my roommate and he was listening to me record this and he just left the room and he's like, I'm gonna go test your theory. So he's about to go try and have himself a little momentary nap to see if it resets him. Another article from Sydney Morning Herald released in May, 2020 by David Algretti talked about what David learned when he too changed his sleeping patterns. He slept 10 p.m. to 2 a.m. Then from 5 a.m. to 7 a.m. for a total of six hours. The first few days he struggled before calling Dr. David Cunnington, a Melbourne-based specialist sleep physician. He said that when it comes to segmented sleep, it's best not to force it. Some people naturally awaken four or five hours in, go to the bathroom, reset, go back to bed, explains Dr. Cunnington. But if they're not like that and they force themselves to wake, they'll be groggy, heavy-headed, hard to get going. And if they were then to make themselves stay awake for one to two hours, they may have trouble getting back to sleep. I was definitely in the latter camp. Dr. Cunnington's solution? Adapting a more siesta style approach to biphasic sleep, a solid block of six to seven hours at night with a nap in the early afternoon. David adjusted to sleep 12 a.m. to 7 a.m., then blocked off time for a one to two hour nap in the afternoon. Yet, according to David, it was a massive struggle for him to sleep properly that week. He said that during a week where he thought about sleeping more than ever, he got worse sleep than getting just one eight hour block. And hey, again, you do you. I think this might work for some and for some maybe not so well. Sleep science doesn't seem to be an exact science as of right now. It looks like it's a growing field and there's still a lot to be learned here, but at least there's enough evidence to say, hey, if you wake up in the middle of the night, it doesn't necessarily mean it's your mattress, sleeping pills or pillows problem. An article from Psychology Today states, Historian Robert Eckert studied writings from ancient times through the pre-industrial age and found that our ancestors slept nightly in two separate periods, separated by one to three hours of wakefulness. These periods were known as first sleep and second sleep. In one interesting study, Thomas Wehr put eight men in a room for a week where they experienced 14 hours of complete darkness a day, replicating what many of our ancestors experienced before electric lights. The men slept for four hours, followed by about three hours of wake wakefulness, and then another four hour period of sleep, replicating the ancient pattern. It is also interesting to note that in the worst study, the men took an average of about two hours to fall asleep, while many of us believe a good night's sleep includes falling asleep as soon as our heads hit the pillow. The causes and consequences of insomnia are many and varied, but it may be helpful for people to know that most of us consider a normal sleep pattern, eight hours of uninterrupted sleep may not be normal after all. This worst study, of course, is a tiny sample Size, so I'm not saying it's undeniable proof of anything at all. All in all, I found this topic quite interesting. 
And it really makes me think about the idea of, are we the ones stuck like with our jobs and our jobs are forcing us into this shit sleep cycle that's disrupting our natural circadian rhythm? Or is the sleep industry perhaps taking advantage of the fact that we now have to conform to an unnatural sleep schedule and profiting billions off of our uneasiness to sleep? It's something I definitely want to relook over in the future, see if there are new studies. I don't know if this means later in the year. I don't know if this means next year or even a couple years from now, or even something that I just personally go through on my own time and never really update with a video again. I don't know. It just makes me really curious to think that, hey, we now have to go through this new cycle of having to be awake to work these eight hours a day during, you know, Monday through Friday, but is the sleep industry also helping us further struggle instead of helping us so that we'll buy more shit? I don't know. And, and obviously I don't know the answer. I'm not a doctor. I'm just someone who found this topic very interesting and I am curious to see how things unfold in the next couple decades as we learn more about sleep as a, something to study. But with all of that being said, that's where I'm going to end today's video. I hope you enjoyed it. And if you did, make sure to hit that like button. If you're new here, make sure to hit that subscribe button too. If you wanna see more content from me, make sure to click open the description box. You're gonna see my link tree link that will have every single social media project I'm involved with, yada, yada, yada. Again, thank you all so much for making it to another video. I love you guys. Make sure to subscribe before you go and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.